All right, we're going to be doing a message here, a request that I've been getting now, I guess, for probably about a year. The thing of near-death experiences and how, you know, whether we should believe them or not. And also the thing of dreams, the subject of dreams. Where are they? Where do they come from? According to scripture. And uh, just a real quick update on our situation, my wife and I, in the ministry here. Uh, we do have a secure place where we're staying. And um, we're still looking for a place. We're, we're going to try and find a place that we can buy uh, for fairly uh, low money. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of money or anything like that, but we're going to try to buy a place out in the mountains because that's where the cheap properties are, and that's where we want to live, too. But I've had a lot of people asking, you know, how's the living situation going? So I thought I just wanted to update real quick there. Uh, we are trying to look for a place right now. We're trying to downsize a lot of the things that we've had. Uh, trying to sell them and things so that we don't have a whole lot to move. So that's where we're at right now with the ministry. Uh, we're looking forward to that time so that we can be firmly grounded, you know, and, and not have to move again and we can have a, our P.O. box and all that good stuff. So that's the update for now. We'll keep everybody posted, uh, let you know when we do find a place and where it's at and everything else. Uh, but just, just pray that the Lord... Um, continues to provide for us, uh, the, the Lord would allow me to keep preaching. It gets difficult at times. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize that. You know, I get this thing a lot of people say, well, I have a full-time job, you know, and, and uh, well, okay, that's good, um, but you get time off. Uh, when you're in ministry, there's really no such thing as time off. You have to force yourself to take time off, and I don't think a lot of people realize that, um, but whatever. I, this is what the Lord's called me to do, and I'm going to do it until He takes me away from here. And uh, not meaning where I'm at currently, I'm just saying from the earth. <laughs> um, why are we inside right now? Well, rain delay, if you could say it that way. I uh, have been wanting to do a, the sermon outside, and it's just not going to happen. Because it's just been raining and raining and raining. So to get the sermon done for Sunday morning, we have to do it inside here. So that's the situation currently. Please keep praying for the ministry. Keep praying for my wife and I. We would appreciate that. So now let's get into the study. We're going to talk today about dreams and near-death experiences. Okay, there's an awful lot of this going around, this, this whole thing of I had this dream and, and then you're supposed to really believe this whole thing. But let's see what the Bible has to say. Now, who was the very first person to dream in the Bible? Well, turn to Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. We're going to see who the, when the very first reference to dream shows up. Genesis chapter 20, verse 1. Okay, it says here, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country, and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister, and Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream, that's the first reference there, by night, and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, She is my sister, and she, even she herself, said, He is my brother, in the integrity of, mine heart, of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning, and called all his servants, and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. So, this is a very interesting thing here. Who did God speak to in a dream? Was he a saved man, or a lost man? He was lost. Abimelech wasn't a saved man. Very interesting. And you know what else is interesting? Were the Ten Commandments given yet? 
The commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery, was that given yet? No, that wasn't given yet. Then how did Abimelech, as a lost man, understand that he was you know, going to be guilty of committing adultery if he touched Sarah? Hmm, that's very interesting. You mean to tell me that the lost person can know that they are sinners? Oh, sure. Here's a man right in the Bible that knows he's a sinner before the Ten Commandments are even given. Why? Because the law is written in your heart. And the lost world out there, this, a lot of people try to say they can't know they're sinners. Yes, they can. Right there's a man who knew he was a sinner before the law is even given. It's very important to realize that. But what about a vision? You see the thing of dreams, what about a vision? Turn to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. I'll show you the very first time that a vision shows up. Genesis chapter 15. Okay, we're going to start out here at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. This is before the law. Abraham was justified by his faith in what God said. Alright? You say, well, then he had the same salvation we do. No, because there was no blood sacrifice that could permanently take away his sins. That didn't happen until Calvary. Abraham did not go straight to heaven when he died, unlike a Christian does today. So while Abraham might have been justified by faith, and he was justified by faith there, he was not saved in the same manner that we are. Don't fall for that. These people that try to say salvation is the same throughout the Bible. They don't know what they're talking about. Continuing here, verse 7, And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. Do you ever have a dream? You know, you go into a deep sleep, and you have this dream, and it's a, like a horror that comes upon you? Yeah. So that's what's going on here. But notice what happens here, verse 13. And he said to, unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. God is giving a prophecy here of what's going to happen in the future. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces." And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. That's important. We'll talk about that in a minute. The Kenites and the uh, Kenazites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. Okay, now, very interesting. The land that God gave to Abraham goes from the river of Egypt there, which I take to be the Nile River, to the river Euphrates. Now, if you look at that on a map, that's not what Israel has today. That original land grant that God gave to Abraham and to his descendants, that thing is huge. 
It takes up a lot of Iraq, a lot of Saudi Arabia. It takes up a lot of land. And what do you have? You have the Jewish people only controlling this little tiny little thing there. Little tiny bit there. That's not the original land that God gave to Abraham. And you say, yes, but the United Nations, you know, they've, they've entered into pacts and treaties and things like this, and they've, they're working things out. God doesn't care. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, the Jews are going to get that land. It doesn't matter. He's going to come down and he's going to destroy the United Nations and all their little packs and their little things that they're trying to do and all this. The Lord Jesus is going to wipe all that stuff out. And some people might say, well, you know, don't the Arabs have a right to that land? After all, they're descendants of Abraham through Ishmael. Let's look about that. Go to Galatians, New Testament, Galatians chapter 4. I know this is kind of a... a side issue here you might say with our study today but I just want to show you this because uh, there's a lot of people out there that are being deceived into thinking that God's all done with the nation of Israel and uh, you know somehow that the church has replaced Israel and all this nonsense not true Galatians chapter 4 verse 22 okay it says here for it is written that Abraham had two sons the one by a bond maid, the other by a free woman. But he who was born, or he, he who was of the bond woman, was born after the flesh. But he who, or, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants: the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Are the Arabs persecuting the Jewish people? Yes. And when the, the Israeli army fights back and kills a bunch of Arabs or something like that, people are like, oh, those evil Jews. Oh, isn't that so horrible? These evil Jews, how they would attack the Arabs and things. They're surrounded. They're encircled. What are they supposed to do? You know, if they lay down their arms, they're going to get wiped out. You know? And you say, well, you know, maybe that would be a good thing. Well, then the Bible would be a lie. All right, God's going to make a full end of all nations except for one, and that's the nation of Israel. Oh, but they're wicked. They're on unbelief. Yes, that's the, that's the reason for the time of Jacob's trouble, which is coming up. God's not done with the Jews. Don't fall for that lie. Bunch of nonsense. Verse 30. Nevertheless, nevertheless what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Okay? The only way that a descendant of Ishmael can become an heir with a, a Jew is by becoming saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way. Because then they're born in with a spirit of adoption. But somebody who's Arabic, who's a descendant of Ishmael, they're not going to inherit that land over there. That land belongs to the Jews like it or not. I'm real sorry for you if you're into replacement theology. But let's look at a few more famous dreams here in the Bible. Next go to Genesis chapter 40. There's a couple dreams that most people are very familiar with. If you're familiar with your King James Bible, you'll know that there's a couple things here in your Bible, a couple dreams that were very famous. Now it's interesting because if you remember what God told Abraham in the vision that he had that night. He said, your seed's going to be greater than the stars of heaven, but they're going to go into bondage in a land, a certain land, and the, the Lord's going to bring them out of that land with great abundance. So how did it get started? Right here is how it got started. Genesis chapter 40, we're going to look at verse 1. 
And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. If you know the story here, Joseph was sold into bondage, okay, into Egypt. Continuing. Verse 4, And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning, and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Now look at this one, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. Who is it that has a right to interpret dreams? You say, um, Sick mind Freud. No. God. Uh, Carl Jung. Uh, no. God. Um, Harvard. The faculties of Harvard, of, of, of Yale, um, our, our brightest psychiatrists, and, and, and uh, this guy who wrote a good book on dreams, and God. The interpretations of dreams belong to God, and God alone. Why? Because God can give those dreams. Let's continue here. Verse 9. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph, and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. You know, obviously he couldn't figure out what, what does this mean. But look what Joseph says here, verse 12. And Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver, deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. He wanted out of jail. Verse 15, For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket there was of all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. Not as good of an interpretation. That's not one you want to hear. Verse 20, And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief buff butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Verse 23, Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Hmm. So then what's the real importance of a dream? Well, here he interprets it for the guy, you know, and the guy forgets him. Joseph is saying, hey, remember me, you know, Remember the fact that the Lord has given me the ability to interpret these dreams. Please don't forget about that, you know, because I want to get out of jail here. I didn't do anything really to deserve to be in here. But continuing, verse 41, or chapter 41. Okay. And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the bank or upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke. 
and he slept and dreamed the second time. Did you ever have two nightmares in one night? <laughs> it's kind of rough. But it says here, verse 5, and, and he slept and dreamed the second time, and behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears, and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt, and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Just like today. You have these people trying to figure out what dreams mean and things like that? No good. Interpretation of dreams belong to God. Verse 9. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants, and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he, we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, an Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams, to each man according to his dream he did interpret. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was, me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself, and changed his raiment, and came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee, that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. Now Joseph could have said, well that's right, I do have quite, you know, these abilities and things. I have, you know, a lot of intellect, and I'm able to interpret dreams. And but look what he says. Verse 16, And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Hmm. Now, did God audibly speak to Pharaoh? You know, did Joseph just kind of stand by and just go like this, and the Lord speaks down from heaven? No. God spoke through Joseph. But Joseph gave the Lord credit for it. You know you better get into that habit in this life. Hey, you know when you get blessed or something or convicted from one of the sermons here? It's not because I'm talented. It's because the Lord spoke through me. You know, if I'm in line with the book, it's because the Lord gave me that ability. I have no natural ability. None. Okay? God chose a weirdo like me, somebody who's weak according to the flesh, to speak through. And if you're going to do anything in this life, it's going to be because God gives you the ability. And you better give Him glory. Alright? Because if you take the glory for yourself, then you're going to get the rewards of people saying, Oh, you're such a wonderful person and such a wonderful man. And, oh, you can really preach. And, oh, brother so-and-so. Uh-huh. That's your reward. And when you hit the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord's going to say, Well, I was going to reward you, but you took all the glory for yourself. Sorry. You know, incredible. But then it goes on here. We're not going to read all these verses, but verse 17 down through um, to verse 36. And he goes through and he tells Pharaoh, you know, that there's going to be seven good years, you know, that they're going to be able to get a lot of crops and things. And after that, there's going to be seven years of famine. So he says, in those seven good years, Make sure that you get things stocked up. Make sure that you, you know, gather the corn and whatever else. Get plenty of grain to make it through the, fa the seven years of famine. And, of course, that's a real good thing. Verse 37. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? See, he recognized what was really true about Joseph. It wasn't his talent. It was God. Verse 39. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand, and arrayed, arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck, 
And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried before him, Bow the knee, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name, and I have no idea how to pronounce that, Zaph, Nath, Pa, Anaya, sorry. <laughs> and he gave him the wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potiph, Potipharah, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. So the dream, the vision that God gave to Abram way back, you know, hundreds of years before this, did it come to pass? Mm -hmm. Isn't that something that God could actually speak to a man in a vision and give him a prophecy about something that would happen hundreds of years later? But that's exactly what he did. Very interesting. But now we're going to go to the the next one, another famous lost ruler who dreamed a dream. Go to the book of Daniel. So you have Pharaoh there. He was another lost man. You had Abimelech was the first one that it says that he dreamed. But then you have Pharaoh after that. Now who's the other lost ruler? Well, who's the man in the book of Daniel? Nebuchadnezzar, right? Daniel chapter 2. Verse 1. Okay, it says here, And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his sleep was troubled, and his sleep brake from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. Now this one's really interesting. If you remember back there with Pharaoh, he told him what the dream was. And then he said, okay, what's it mean? And all these wise men were going, I don't know. I don't know what that means. You know, they couldn't tell. You see, when these guys said, I want you to tell me the, the interpretation of the dream, and you're going to see this in a minute here. When they said that, it wasn't like, oh, well, we don't know. Oh, okay, never mind. Don't worry about it. It was like, you're going to tell me this or you're going to die. That's why they were more honest. See, now you can have people trying to quote-unquote interpret your dream, and they don't have to worry about you being killed if they fail. So they can lie to you and think, oh, you know, yeah, they interpreted my dream when in reality, when in reality they didn't. Continuing here. Verse 3, And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Whoa. <laughs> but if ye show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of my gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that ye would gain the time, because ye see the thing is gone from me. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you, for ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. That's the truth. King Nebuchadnezzar wasn't such a foolish man after all. He was a very wise man. You see, if somebody can tell you, if they're smart enough to tell you the interpretation of it, they have that ability, well, then they should also have the supernatural ability to tell you what the dream was itself. But see, these guys were fakers like a lot of the modern psychiatrists that try to interpret dreams. They were fakers. And the king knew it. And he said, if you're real, if you're legitimate, you'll be able to tell me not only the interpretation, but what the actual dream was without me telling you. It's pretty incredible. But uh, let's continue here. Verse 10. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. 
Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things at any magician, or astrologer, or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Isn't that interesting? I've got to stop there again for a minute. These pagan philosophers are saying that the only one that could tell this are the gods up there. They don't even acknowledge that there's just one god. They say the gods, but they don't dwell with flesh. The gods in heaven, they don't speak to men. Uh, why did they say that? Because they were lost. You know why a lot of the modern day philosophers and psychiatrists say, you know, there's no such thing as God and stuff? Because they're lost too. They can't imagine that the God of the universe would dwell with flesh. Some, you know, nobody like me. And like a lot of you out there too. If you're saved, God is dwelling with you. With flesh. Isn't that something? Verse 12. For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. And he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time, and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <clears throat> Verse 18. That they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Verse 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. you got to keep that one in mind too. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon, bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captains of Judah, that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream to which I have seen, and the interpretation thereof? Again, notice what he does. He says, Are you able? Art thou able? And Daniel comes back and says, Of course I am. I am very educated. I have a PhD and a THD, and I took a minor in psychiatry and stuff like that. That's not what he says. Verse 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So already he's starting to tell him what this dream's about. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What shall come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets, secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. But for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Okay? Then he goes into this, this image, you know, this statue basically that has these five, that represents five different kingdoms. Okay? Which we're not going to go into that. But the point is, you see there again, a lost man dreams a dream. When the people, the, what we would call psychiatrists today, or, or therapists, or whatever else, when those people are given the choice of give us the real interpretation or die, they can't. 
They can't. They really have no idea what this dream means. And when Daniel is brought before the king, he doesn't say, Oh yeah, you know, I can figure it out, king. I mean, I'm real good at this stuff. He gives all glory to God. And he says, God is the one that is able to figure out what this thing means. Alright? Very, very important to understand that. But what about another dream happening to a saved man? Turn next to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. In the Bible, there's no, there's no real uh, discrimination there. I mean, it's not like God only speaks to the saved people through dreams. No, He speaks to both, saved and lost. And of course, you know, later on it, it does kind of look like Nebuchadnezzar after his pride is knocked down for a few years and he's out there in the fields like an animal for a while. You know, it kind of does look like the guy actually, you know, gets saved. I don't know. It's an interesting thing. But uh, Matthew chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when his, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph... Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins." Now look at this, verse 22. Now here is a key verse to this issue of dreams. Alright? What was the point of the, of the vision that God gave to Abram? What was the point? So he could give a prophecy about what was going to happen in the future recorded in Scripture. Okay? What was the point of God speaking to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream? Because, again, he was showing a prophecy of the future that was going to happen in Scripture. Alright? You, you look at the whole thing here. You look at all the, all the times when there's dreams given and things. It's always going back to Scripture. Look at verse 22. Now, all this was done, the dream was given to Joseph, all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophets, saying... Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and he took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son. It's also very important. And he called his name Jesus. Mary had more than one son, by the way. She had a bunch of kids. But you see... Now the new versions will take that very important word out right there. Firstborn. Okay? You don't say firstborn son when a woman only has one child. Like the Catholics teach. Okay, Roman Catholicism tries to say the perpetual virginity of Mary. Uh-uh. Wrong. If she did that, she'd be in sin because she's actually withholding her body from her husband. Alright? That'd be sin. Now, Mary had many children. Okay, Jesus was just the firstborn. Very important to get that. But again, you see the thing there. What was the point of this angel coming to Joseph in a dream? That the scripture might be fulfilled. So then a dream that comes from God would have to be in line with this book. Remember that. That's going to be important later. Alright, go next to Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. Matthew chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Still very good today, by the way. <laughs> and being warned of God in a dream, in a dream, that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, 
and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod shall s or will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophets, saying, Out of Egypt I ha have I called my son. So we see, again, another dream for Joseph that's intended to fulfill Scripture. Huh. One more place here. Go down to verse 19 in that same chapter. Matthew chapter 2, verse 19. Okay. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. And when he heard that Archelaus uh, did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. An angel of the Lord comes to Joseph three different times, and not once is it just for, hey, neat dream. No, it's to fulfill the word of God. To fulfill that which is spoken. All right? In the prophets. A lot of it's Isaiah. You know? Those prophecies that the Lord gave to Isaiah about Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah, and the angel of the Lord's coming down and giving dreams to Joseph and saying, go do this, go do that, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So if you get a dream, maybe you ought to see if it lines up with scripture. Just a thought now, you know, and not go to the astrologers and magicians and psychiatrists and philosophers and things like that. That'll be important. Okay. Now, is there a danger in dreams? You know, can you say that all dreams out there all have some kind of prophetic significance and they can all, there's no real danger in people dreaming dreams and telling the interpretation thereof and stuff like that. Is there a danger in dreams? Turn back to Jeremiah chapter 23. It's going to be a longer study today because there's a lot of scripture to cover and there's a lot of other things I need to talk about. So, Jeremiah chapter 23. If you're into fast food uh, Bible sermons, this isn't a sermon for you. You probably ought to just shut it off now and go watch, you know, other videos on YouTube. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 16. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart. We're going to hear some of those later. And not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, Ye shall have peace. Yeah, look out for that. And they say unto every one that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord, and, and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. I stopped there for a reason, okay? If you know what just happened out there in Oklahoma not too long ago, this big bad tornado that went one of the worst in history, and it's out there and a lot of people died and things, did you know that there was also a sodomite pride rally going on at the same time? And they had a sodomite parade? You see, I thought it was gay. No, gay means happy, okay? And that's not the words that Bible believers should use. The word is sodomite. All right? And it's very easy to, to kind of fall in with the modern PC terms and you end up saying what they say. Your King James Bible has the word gay as a positive word. Sodomite is a word. All right? And those sodomites out there, they bring the wrath of God. 
I'll tell you what, if there's a sodomite parade, sodomite, sodomite pride parade in your area, you might do well to just kind of go on vacation for a little while. Protest the thing if it's coming in. Don't let them come to your area. The sodomites are bringing God's wrath down on this country. And God, it says there, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind, that's what a tornado is, it shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The Lord calls sodomy an abomination. It's right there. But let's continue here on the subject of the dreams. Jump down to verse 20 there. Okay, it says here, The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days ye shall consider it perfectly. Oh boy, look at that one. The time of Jacob's trouble, they'll consider the wrath of the Lord at that time perfectly. They'll get to see the greatest examples of it that they've, I mean, you can't even imagine what the Lord's going to do. Verse 21, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, notice that, they're saying that they have visions and dreams and things from their own mind. They're making it up. But if they had caused the people to hear the words of God, the Bible, preach the Bible, not your dreams and your visions. Very interesting. And had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophets said, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. And we're going to see two good examples of it later. I'm going to read some of this stuff. Continuing, verse 27, Which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, and their, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream, and he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord." Watch out for this thing of, I dreamed, I had this dream, I had this vision, I was dead for 24 hours, and I saw all this stuff. Okay, if somebody has that happen, then you compare everything that they say with this book. And if it doesn't line up here, then they're lying to you. God is not going to show somebody a vision or a dream and not have it line up with this book. God's not going to contra contradict the book. No way. And you see what these false prophets do when a nation is falling apart. Just like Israel fell apart, the United States has fallen apart. The UK has fallen apart. Australia has fallen apart. All the nations out there are falling apart right now. And just like what happened back there in the Bible times, instead of men coming up and saying, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Word of God says, instead of them doing that, they say, I had a dream. Oh, it was the most beautiful dream. You aren't going to believe. And then they put on some nice little music in the background to make it more emotional and things like that. And I saw the terrors of hell. I was there. And I'll tell you what I saw in my vision. And what they did is they concocted the whole stupid thing back whenever. And they're telling you and they're lying to you. And like I said, I'm going to show you two good examples of this thing. Two real famous quote-unquote near-death experiences, you know, these visions that people get. I want to show you two of them. You aren't going to believe the stuff that's in it. All right. 
turn next to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. You say, well, where do dreams come from? Ecclesiastes chapter 5. This is kind of an interesting thing here. Now, I'm not going to be doing a big study here on the thing of dreams, what they are, where do they come from, whatever else, as far as, you know, all the details and everything. I'm just going to show you what the Bible says, okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 through 3 says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. In other words, shut up. <laughs> you know, to be blunt, shut up. Just keep your mouth shut, be more ready to hear. You know, that's why God gave you two ears and one mouth. Because you should listen twice as much as you speak. Alright? Verse 2. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. Verse 3. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. You know one of the ways I think that dreams come about? It's because of your multitude of business. You know, we call it multitasking today. You know, you have, you're listening to a sermon on uh, YouTube or something like that while you are got the coffee machine out there going, getting ready to, to have your coffee ready, and you got, you're working on a project here and stuff like that, and you go, oh, I got, that's right, I got to write that check out and stuff like this. And, and you're doing like 10 things at the same time. You know, and then you go to bed and you have these weird, nutty dreams and you go, wake up in the morning and go, where on earth did that thing come from? Well, it's because of the multitude of business. <laughs> you know, the times that I've slept the best is when I have my mind focused on one thing. But when I have these really weird dreams, it's because I'm, I'm on the computer and I'm answering this person and answering that person. Oh, I got to do this video and oh, I got that order for tomorrow and I got this and I got that and whatever else, you know. And, uh... I'm going to give you an example here. This is going to tickle some of you. You're going to love this. You know, I had this dream. I have some weird ones sometimes. I mean, my wife, she can attest to these. I mean, I go wake up in the morning, I go, you will not believe the dream I had. <laughs> I have some strange dreams. You know, and this one time I had this dream. I'm at this farm, and, you know, there's this guy there, and he's got these rabbits. And I said to him, I said, do any of these rabbits produce honey? And he said, well, yes, a few of these do. And I said, but is it pure organic honey? Because I'm looking for organic honey bunnies. Okay, now pick yourself up off the floor there, you know. It's okay. <laughs> you know, you say, where'd that come from? I have no idea. I have no idea. But now, would it be right for me to say that, now, organic honey bunny... That must be some sign from the Lord that this is some kind of a thing. Maybe I should go out and preach the gospel of organic honey bunnies. No. You know why? Because they're not in the Bible. Alright? I'm not going to go out and preach the gospel of organic honey bunnies. Okay? You see, you compare your dream with the Bible. It doesn't matter what my stupid dream was. I mean, weird dream... It doesn't matter what my dream is. Does it line up here? All right? That's the issue here. And I'm going to show you the relevance of this thing coming up. Because there are some people that have these kooky, they call it dreams. I think some of it's just made up. But they say they have these weird dreams and stuff. Well, it's a vision from God. And then you hear their dream and it contradicts scripture. What does that mean? It means that they're dreaming about organic honey bunnies. You say, what's that? Not reality. Cuckooville up here. You know, maybe they had too many tacos or they had pizza or something or peanut butter or something like that before they went to bed. I don't know what the deal is. You know, a lot of your dreams are just because of the multitude of business. All the things that you're doing through the day and you might, you know, I might have seen a rabbit and might have been thinking about honey or I had to get some more honey at the store or something like that and it all just kind of goes and jumbles together into the subconscious up here and as you're sleeping it all just kind of comes out and comes out of this weird dream. doesn't mean it's a vision from God. You need to be careful about that. And all these people, you know, another big thing right now is this thing of rapture dreams. I've seen a lot of people have that. And you say, Brian, have you ever had a rapture dream? Yes. 
I've had quite a few of them. You say, oh, well then that proves the rapture. No, that proves that I dream about the rapture. I'm not about to prove Bible doctrine by my dreams. No way. My dreams are not a valid um, standard of truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. That's the standard. Written scripture. Get that thing. Don't forget it. That's very important. All right, now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Are there any near-death experiences in the Bible? Yes. And I'm going to show you again, and, and pay attention to these scriptures. Because all you got to do is just read the Bible, and you see these nuts that come out, and they say, I died and went to heaven. I was officially dead, and I went, and, I, and this is what I saw. Interpret it in with the scripture here, and you're going to see there's a big problem there. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. Paul says here, It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was called up into paradise and heard unspeakable, unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Wait a second. Then you shouldn't talk about what you heard up there? Huh. You say, well, John did. And back in the book of Revelation, yeah, because it was to fulfill Scripture. What Paul was told there wasn't about fulfilling Scripture. It was just what he experienced. He's walking around up there in heaven. I believe if you read the account back in the book of Acts where he's actually stoned to death, and they're all just going, oh, poor Paul. You know, they're standing there. They think he's dead. And all of a sudden he gets back up and goes back to preaching. <laughs> you know, I think that's what when this event happened. But continuing here, verse 5. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seemeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. So in other words, a man that actually was taken up to heaven, that really truly did die, and he really truly had a near-death experience, he said, I'm not going to talk about it. Why? Because I don't want to glory. I don't want you thinking that I'm some kind of special person. Paul wanted to magnify the book. He said, I'm not going to take any glory away from this book, from the written word of God. Don't look to me as an authority. No, no, it's here. Here. I'm not going to glory. Did he have a right to glory? Yeah, he did. But he wouldn't. Again, remember that. It's going to be important later. What about another man that had a, not near-death experience, he had a death experience. Go to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. Okay, it says here, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things? But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, 
so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now what would that be? If Abraham said, yeah, okay, that would be considered a near-death experience, wouldn't it? Here's this poor man, Lazarus, and he's laying there dead on the street, and all of a sudden, uh, and he opens his eyes, and everybody goes, oh, he was dead, and now he's back alive, right? And Lazarus goes, I have to, I've been brought back to go and speak to the rich men's brethren. That's what a lot of these near-death experiences are supposed to be. But look at what Abraham says. Verse 29, Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Moses and the prophets? You mean written scripture? Here's a chance, a golden opportunity. Are you kidding me? Send Lazarus back. Send him back, you know, back to life. And this isn't the same Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead. This is a different one. Send him back. He could speak to the rich man's brethren. They'd get saved for sure then, wouldn't they? And Abraham says, no. They have written scripture. Let him read that. Let him hear them. Verse 30, And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Huh. So in other words, if you have lost people and they can't accept what's in this book, then somebody dying and being dead for a few days and coming back from the dead isn't going to mean a thing. Hey, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the dreams of the person that was dead for 24 hours and came back. Is that what it says? No. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So then you don't need anything more than this book. That's right. And if somebody says, ah, that stupid old King James Bible, that old Bible believing, eh, fundamentalism, meh, 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 meh. okay, you're going to hell. Oh, but couldn't we have somebody that would die and be dead for a few days and then come back? That would convince them. No. It's the book. This is what regenerates somebody. This is where eternal life comes from. The book. It doesn't come from me. It doesn't come from my dreams. It doesn't come from your dreams or anybody else's dreams. It comes from written scripture. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Written. 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 Not near-death experiences. But let me just show you a couple things here. I'm going to look at two famous uh, near-death experiences that are going around. And these are essentially dreams that these people are having. Okay? They go into this dead state where they're supposedly clinically dead. And then they're there and they, you know, they have this vision. And, you know, then they come back and they tell it. And all these people go, wow. You know, and they'll sit there and they'll listen for an hour and a half, two hours to this, this silly vision that these people have. And they go, wow. It must be from God because they said it's from God and they were clinically dead and all this stuff. You know, they won't sit there for an hour and a half hearing Bible preaching, but they'll listen to somebody telling about their dream. Why? Because that's how the things work when a society's falling apart. The prophets who prophesy lies in the name of the Lord come along and try to tell you about their dreams, telling you God showed me the dream when God didn't show them anything. Okay? First we have Prepare to meet your God, the kingdoms of heaven and hell, and the return of Christ by Angelica Zambrano. Okay? Now, there's a huge, a bunch of huge problems with this bunch of nonsense that this girl put out. Okay? Here we go. For a period of 23 hours, a young Ecuadorian girl named Angelica was shown the kingdoms of heaven and hell and the return of Christ. She witnessed Jesus weeping as he overlooked multitudes of souls lost forever, a world that has rejected him, a church that is mostly unprepared for him, a people that have stopped witnessing to the lost, and an entertainment industry that even lures children to Satan. 
She witnessed many of our esteemed cultural icons suffering in the pit. Singers, entertainers, and even a pope. Just a pope, I guess not all of them. You know, yeah. Angelica was also shown the, how the kingdom of heaven is all wonderfully prepared and ready, an unimaginable glorious place where no evil exists. Though Jesus is only coming back for a holy people, and many of God's children will not be ready on that day and will be left behind in a world that will fall apart. Okay, do you know your Bible, your King James Bible? If you do, you can immediately see a couple problems there. First of all, and you're going to see this in her testimony, she talks about the kingdom of heaven. That she saw the kingdom of heaven. But the kingdom of heaven in the King James Bible is a physical, visible, earthly kingdom on the earth. Headquartered in Jerusalem, which will come in in the millennial kingdom. It's not where God dwells. So, big problem there, number one. Number two, she's saying that She's teaching a split rapture, which is what a lot of the Pentecostal charismatics believe. That there's going to be a split rapture. Those Christians that are doing right, go up. Those Christians that are doing wrong, stay here. It's nonsense. The body of Christ is not going to be split at the rapture. The saved are leaving, the lost are staying. Watch my pre trib rapture moment on that. Okay? So, you know, and there's something else that's interesting. Did anyone other than her family actually confirm that she died? No. See, people are so quick to just go, Oh, she was dead for 23 hours. But according to who? Her own family. That are all also charismatics. See? They didn't call the ambulance. They didn't have any of the coroner come in and pronounce her dead or anything. It was just, oh, she's laying there dead. We have a picture of her going, you know... <laughs> That, that proves that she's dead. Uh-huh. They didn't prove it. Secondly, does her vision line up with the Bible? No. Let's continue here. My name is Maxima Zambrano Mora, her mother, in other words. And, when the, and we attend the Casa de Oration Church in El Empalme. We were fasting for 15 days and crying out to God. My daughter Angelica also joined us. During those 15 days of fasting, I was able to see beyond the natural, which I've never done before. We were praying and fasting at the retreat and even continued praying and crying out at home, waiting for God to speak to us. Um, if you're waiting for God to speak to you, all you got to do is pick one of these up. God will speak to you. You don't need to wait and pray and say, I left the natural world and God started speaking to me. Hey, there are different gods. There's two of them. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. You know? Maybe they got in contact with the God of this world instead of the God of the Bible. Did you ever think of that? Oh, no, of course not, because we know that all dreams come from God, you know, including organic honey bunnies. Had to throw that in there. But also, could 15 days of fasting have made them partly delusional? Oh yeah. If they were actually fasting for 15 days, nothing to eat and, you know, very little to drink or anything, 15 days of fasting could kind of put you in a weird mental state. Especially if you're not saved. She goes on to talk about her salvation. She says here, quote, But as time passed by, I felt no change. The only difference was that I began to attend church, to read the Bible, and to pray. That was the only change in my life. That's the only change? Reading the Bible, praying, attending church? And that's, that's all that ever happened. You know, like that's, you know, not exciting enough or something. Continuing here. Then in August, I was invited to fast for 15 days. I decided to join, but before entering, I said, Lord, I want you to deal with me here. During the fast, the Lord was speaking to almost everybody except me. It was as if the Lord had not seen me, and that hurt. I would pray, Lord, aren't you going to deal with me? I would cry alone and continue, Lord, do you love me? Are you here? Are you with me? Why don't you speak to me like you do to everyone else? You speak so many things to other people, even words of prophecy, but not me. I asked for a sign that he was with me. Oh boy. 
an adulterous and wicked generation seeketh after a sign. And the Lord gave me, Jeremiah 33, 3, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Not even King James. So, you know, the Lord's given her new version renderings. <laughs> okay. She goes on to say, quote, I said, Lord, did you just talk to me? Because I heard his audible voice and had a vision of the words written in Jeremiah 33, 3. She heard his audible voice. Now, I do believe that the Lord speaks to people. The Lord speaks to me sometimes. The Lord shows me things. But it's not this, Brian Denlinger, I have a word of prophecy for you. you know, it's not that. You can know when the Lord's speaking to you. This thought will kind of come into your head and it'll kind of be like, what about this or what about that verse or something like that? And you kind of go, yeah, that makes sense. Or, wait a second, does that line up with Scripture? You know, the Bible says you're not to believe every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. You know, you don't just say, I heard an audible voice, it was God. Man, you better be careful about that stuff. Now, after this experience that she has, she has this quote-unquote man of God come. And he says to her, soon we be, this is what happens, soon we began to pray. Some sisters from our church and others from my family were there with us praying. But as soon as we started praying, I began to see the heavens open. So I said, I see the heavens are opening, and two angels are coming down. The man said, ask them why they are here. They were tall and beautiful with beautiful wings. Uh-oh. They were large and shining and seemed transparent, brilliant as gold. They wore crystal sandals and had on holy garments. Chapter and verse. There's not one winged angel in this whole book. Not one. You say, what about the cherubim? What about the seraphim? They're not angels. They're a different order. You know, I would say that there's some kind of an angelic being, but they're not angels. Okay, cherub, cherubim have four wings. Seraphim have six. And they don't wear crystal shoes, for crying out loud. What are they, Cinderella or something? <laughs> you know, crystal sandals. Give me a break. Yeah, sandals, not shoes. Yeah. Continuing here, she says, I could see, play with, and even talk to the Holy Spirit. Huh? Play with the Holy Spirit? But the angels would not talk to me, but they would praise the Lord. I would say, Holy Spirit, come along with me to do this or that, and He would be there. I could feel and see Him. You know? <laughs> Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. You know, I was like, the Holy Spirit's a little dog or something. Here, boy, here, boy, here, boy. And he runs over. You know, what do you want me to do? Playing with the Holy Spirit. People, how can you be deceived by this? Don't be deceived by this. It's nonsense. Now we will get into her supposed vision. Quote, I told Jesus, I will testify that hell is real, that hell exists, but take me out of here now. And he replied, Daughter, we haven't even entered that place, and I have shown you nothing yet, and already you want me to take you out of this place? Lord, please take me out of here, I said. Then we started to descend into the, into the abyss. I started to cry and scream, Lord, no, 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 I don't want to go. And he would reply, You need to see this. Really? The written word of God's not enough? You need to see this vision of what hell is. I don't need to see no vision. I have the written word of God. I can imagine what hell looks like. I've preached a whole sermon on it using scripture, not demented visions that I concocted. Continuing, she says here, quote, The Lord said to me, Are you ready to see what I am going to show you? Yes, Lord, I said. He took me to a cell, cell where I could see a young man being tormented among the flames. I noticed that the cell was enumerated, though I couldn't understand the numbers. They seemed to be backward. There was a huge plaque in that cell, and the young man had the number 666 on his forehead. Um, how did the young man have 666 on his forehead when this vision was given to her before the events of Revelation? Uh, so the man somehow took the mark of the beast, the young man took the mark of the beast before the mark of the beast shows up on the earth? Yeah. 
continuing, quote, The Lord said, There is no other opportunity for those here. There is still opportunity for those who are alive. I asked him, Lord, why is my great-grandmother here? I don't know if she ever knew you. Why is she here in hell, Lord? He replied, Daughter, she is here because she failed to forgive. Daughter, he who does not forgive, neither will I forgive him. No, the people in hell are there, not because they didn't forgive somebody, but because they themselves didn't have their sins forgiven. They didn't put their faith in Jesus Christ. So, according to this little dingbat here, Jesus is preaching a false gospel. She didn't forgive other people, and so that's why she went to hell. What? Continuing, quote, I asked, Lord, but you do forgive, and you are merciful. And he answered, Yes, daughter, but it is necessary to forgive, because they have not forgiven many people, and that is why many people are in this place, because they failed to forgive. Go and tell humanity that it is time to forgive, and especially my people, for many of my people have not forgiven. Tell them to rid themselves of grudges, of resentment, of that hatred in their hearts, for it is time to forgive. If death were to surprise that person who has failed to forgive, that person may, may go to hell, for no one can purchase life. So then salvation apparently is, is you know, dependent on your works, according to this. According to this, what this girl said Jesus told her. Yeah. Continuing, quote, The Lord said, Daughter, these are also people who know me that are walking to this place. I asked, Lord, how can people who know you also come here? He replied, That person who has left my ways and that person who is living a double life. Again, she's teaching salvation by works. Hmm. Continuing, quote, There's much more to be said about hell, but now I'll show you what I saw in heaven. Jesus said, Daughter, now I am going to show you what I have prepared for my holy people. We left that place going out through a tunnel. While traveling through this tunnel, we suddenly came out to where there was light. I saw no more darkness, torment, or flames. He said, Daughter, I am going to show you my glory. And we started ascending to the kingdom of heaven. Soon we arrived at a door with giant letters written in gold that said, Welcome to the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 11, 12. Chapter 11, verse 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Uh, if this young lady would actually just read the Bible, she would see that uh, her little dream thing, if it was actually real, that she actually had this dream, it was the odd imagination of her own thoughts. I wouldn't be surprised if there were organic honey bunnies in her dream. She just didn't want to tell you about them. You never know. Continuing here, quote, I saw how Mary worshipped the Lord, and I saw women with very beautiful long hair. I said, Lord, how pretty the way they wear their hair. He told me, Daughter, that which you see is the veil that I have given to a woman. He had a daughter. Go and tell women to take care of the veil that I have given them. Now that's important. You know, the Lord has to show her the vision so he, she can come back and say, Take care of your hair, ladies. <laughs> okay. And also, uh, women in heaven? I thought the Bible teaches that when in the resurrection will be as the angels of God in heaven. All angels are men. The Bible says that we are the sons of God and that we will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Uh, last time I checked, Jesus Christ was a man. You can listen to my study on the resurrection. You know, I have a whole thing on that. Nonsense. Continuing, quote, Then I understand why he was weeping, because he is coming, but not for those that are half-hearted. He will return only for a people that is seeking him in spirit and in truth. Okay. So in other words, those Christians that are not walking right with the Lord, they're going to be left behind. This was exactly what she's teaching here. Continuing, quote, I saw those who had known the Lord, but were left behind. Then she quotes Matthew chapter 24. <laughs> All right. They were saying that Christ had come, the rapture happened. They screamed and wanted to kill themselves, but they couldn't. The Lord told me, daughter, in those days, death will flee. Daughter, in those days, the Holy Spirit will no longer be on earth. Uh, what about within the 144,000 sealed Jews? Uh, I think the Holy Spirit's going to be around. 
Continuing here, quote, But not everyone will go with the Lord, only those who are doing His will and living a holy life. See? Works. For the Lord told me, Only those that are holy will enter the kingdom of heaven. No one knows, neither the day nor the hour in which I will go for my holy people. Not even the angels know it. So, this liar has Jesus Christ saying that salvation is by works. One more quote here from her. She says, quote, With angels gathered round, we began to descend those beautiful stairs with white steps with flowers surrounding them. I was crying all the way down, pleading with Jesus, Lord, please don't leave me here. Take me with you. He responded, Daughter, the nations, your family, you are waiting for you. Daughter, you must enter that body. You must receive life, daughter, so you can go and testify what you have seen. Many will not believe you. Many will believe you. But I am your faithful witness. I am with you. I will never leave you. Uh, well, first of all, she claims that Jesus can leave certain people if you're not keeping the faith in things and being faithful. <laughs> so to say that Jesus will never leave you, well, she just said that Jesus is going to leave certain members of the body of Christ. So that's a problem. But also this thing of, you know, saying, I want you to go back and give people this dream. I thought it's the word that we're supposed to be giving people. And why would the Lord speak through a woman? I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Apparently she missed that. Or maybe this Jesus that was speaking to her in her dream, maybe he missed that. Oh yeah, I bet. It's charismatic nonsense, people. That's all this thing is. They made the whole thing up. I guarantee you. There was nobody there to witness her death. Nobody but her own family. They lied about the whole thing. They just showed their own. And she had a thing in there the one time too where, where God said you know, that, that he loves the sinner but hates the sin or something like this. It's all these little cliches of the modern church and she puts it in that the Lord spoke these things to her. It's nonsense. Don't fall for it. One other thing here, one other near-death experience. This is a Buddhist monk that died and went to hell and came back. Quote, After some time I crossed a river and saw a terrible lake of fire. I was confused because Buddhism knows of no such thing. I did not know that it was hell until I met Yama, the king of hell. The what? His face was that of a lion, his feet like snakes. That's a trick. And he had many horns on his head. When I asked his name, he said, I am the king of hell, the destroyer. Chapter and verse. Please show me the king of hell in here, named Yama. Not in there. But it keeps getting worse. The king of hell said, That is Goliath. He sees this big giant guy. He says, That is Goliath, who was in hell because he mocked the eternal God and his servant David. I had never heard of Goliath or David. Another king of hell? Wow, two kings of hell? Isn't that wonderful? Approached me and asked, Are you also going into the lake of fire? No, I said. I am just here to look. You are right, the creature said. You only came to look, and I can't find your name. You'll have to go back to where you came from. What a vision. Yeah, what a liar. You know, and this whole thing, you know, people people are like, Oh, you know, but, you know, he didn't have the Bible, and he got saved then, and he went out and he converted all these people, and he went to prison for it and everything else. And, hey, people go to prison for all sorts of things. And I didn't see anything in here about the kind of gospel that this guy was preaching. He could have been just as deceived as any devil-possessed person out there. Just because he said, oh, I, I got saved and I went out and I was preaching and I got put in prison for it. That doesn't mean he was a Christian. Give me a break. But it's interesting because if you look on YouTube and you see this video about this monk that died and came back and all this, the video is on YouTube is linked to a channel called One one the one okay now if you go into there and he has a bunch of videos listed here's some of his videos that he has listed now remember what what is the purpose of this dreaming thing they're saying i've dreamed the dream i've seen a vision i've seen this thing why they don't want to teach the word of god to people it's because they're against the book 
they don't want you knowing the book. Listen to what this devil, this one, the one, the one, or whatever the guy's name is, listen to what he has in some of his videos. One of his videos here. People poisoned by Bible knowledge and Bible study of Scripture twisting. The most dangerous thing for a Christian or anyone in the world is to become indoctrinated by Scripture. It, it, Scripture, is the single deepest, darkest darkness that exists on this earth. Another video. When Bible study doesn't help you. Another video. Why many Bible believers are lost. How about this one? Deception of rightly dividing the word of truth. Oh, isn't that just wonderful? Another non-dispensational loser. Another person that says, I refuse to rightly divide the word of truth. What do you have here? You have these people that are possessed with devils. And what they're trying to do is, they're trying to say, You don't need that Bible. I had a dream. I had a dream. And you don't need the Bible. You can listen to me. Because after all, I had a vision come directly from God. And you wouldn't question my vision which came directly from God, would you? After all, I mean, you shouldn't do that. That wouldn't be very nice. So what's really behind these near-death experiences? Genesis chapter 3. Two more places to turn to today, and then we're done. Genesis chapter 3. Now, if you're a Bible believer, you already know where I'm going with this. Genesis 3, 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. The very first time that a question appears in your King James Bible, it's spoken by Satan. He's subtle. Kind of like he'd come to you in your dreams and give you visions in your mind. And in those visions he'd say, Yea, hath God said. He'll give you a, co a counterfeit version of Scripture, and it'll be very close many times. But it'll be just a little tiny bit off. Not much, mind you, just a little tiny bit. Let's not make such problems over just a few words that are changed. You see? And then he has you. Continuing. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden, and the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. She lied, God didn't say that, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Satan uses that same trap over and over and over again. And one of the best ways for him to do it is take away the book by giving you dreams and visions. Because, boy, sometimes you'll have these dreams and it'll seem so real to you. It'll seem like, wow, man, what was that? That was weird. You'll wake up in the morning and just be troubled by it. You'll wake up in a cold sweat and just be like, man, what was that? Well, I think a lot of times it's because of the multitude of business. All the things that you're doing in your day, and they all get jumbled together, and your mind is thinking about those things, and you go to sleep, and, and all of a sudden you're dreaming about organic honey bunnies. <laughs> you know? Doesn't mean it's from the Lord trying to give you a vision that you should go out and try to crossbreed bees and bunnies to produce organic honey. Alright? It doesn't mean that. I know some of you are excited right now that I could be able to do that thing. You know, you'd like to buy some of the honey because it'd probably be pretty good, but I'm sorry I can't do it. <sighs> One more place to go to. Joel chapter 2. You say, is there going to come a time when dreams are going to come back? Yeah, actually there are. Joel chapter 2, verse 21. Okay, Joel 2.21 Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Verse 23 
Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain, in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am the, in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Verse 28, Joel 2, 28. And it shall come to pass afterward, afterward, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, what's the context? The context, I believe, is at the second coming. When the sun and the moon are darkened and everything, and then when they go into that millennial kingdom, and God restores the land, and gives them that land that was promised to Abram, think about that. Way back, thousands of years ago, God speaks to a man in a dream, to Abram, Abe, who later became Abraham. God speaks to him and he says, hey, your children are going to go into bondage to a land that you know not. They're going to go into this land of Egypt and they're going to go in bondage for 400 years and I'm going to bring them out with great substance. And then he's going to come and he's going to restore them later on. And he says, I'm going to give you that land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. That's their land. Were the Jews ever given that land? No. They fought for the land under King David, but they never got that land. They never had that land under their control, but they will one day. And it's not going to be because the white Europeans come in with the Lord and then we all get the land and because there's no Jews anymore or something. Nonsense. Absolute total nonsense. No, the Lord is going to give them that land and at that point in time, He's going to speak to these people in dreams and visions. And He will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Upon all that Jewish remnant that makes it through the time of Jacob's trouble. They're all going to come in to that time and the Lord's going to speak to them with dreams and visions. But not today. Not right now. Right now, in this church age, this is the book. And in the time of Jacob's trouble, the Bible says that they're going to be slain for the testimony of Jesus and for the Word of God. The book. This is where it's at. And somebody comes along, some liar comes along and they say, I had a dream. I died. I was clinically dead. And you aren't going to believe the things I saw. You need to say, yeah, you're absolutely right. I won't believe the things you saw unless they line up with the book. And if they line up with the book, I'm still going to put the book above your dreams. I'm not going to fall for your dreams. Do not fall for this deception, this lie that people have that they died, and they went to heaven, and they saw all these wonderful things, and God sent them back for the special purpose. Not going to happen. Lazarus, down there in Abraham's bosom, and the rich man says, Send him back from the dead. Send him back from the dead to speak to my brethren. And Abraham's, Abraham says, No. No, he doesn't say, hey, you know, that's a good idea. I think I'm going to kill Christians down there, bring them up here, show them, speak to them, give them special revelation that's not in, in the Bible, and then send them back. That's not of the Lord. There's a perfect opportunity there for the rich man, his relatives, you know, to be preached to by Lazarus, coming back from the dead. Abraham says, no, they have Moses and the prophets. They have the word of God, and if they reject that, then they go to hell. It's as simple as that. Don't be deceived by this movement. 
the dreams, the near-death experiences, the visions, and everything. Don't be deceived by it. All right? Could God speak to you in a vision? Yeah, he probably could. But if it doesn't line up with the book, then you better reject it. Because I don't think that the Lord is the only one that has access to your brain. You know, sometimes it's just your own, you know, busy schedule. Sometimes it's something you ate before you went to bed, whatever else. But dreams are not reliable. The book is. Don't let anybody take you away from the book. All right? Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that we're not left without a witness. I always pray that way, Lord, but it's so true. Because if we did not have your word, people could deceive us right and left. They could tell us that they've had a vision. They could tell us they could fake things, Lord, and we would just be totally blind, totally helpless down here. We'd fall for anything, any kind of con artist scam that comes along. But, Lord, we do have your word. We do have a perfect standard in the King James Bible. And we can listen to these people and we can say, wait a second, what you're saying doesn't line up with the book. And therefore, Lord, we can reject them. And Lord, if there's going to be any revival in Christians' lives, and I don't mean worldwide revival, I don't mean turning back to good times, I don't mean that, Lord. I mean, if there's going to be Christians that are, are reawakening to what you want for their lives, if that's going to happen, Lord, it's going to be because they're following your word and not the teachings of men. And Lord, I do pray for that. I pray that there will be a movement, Lord, of a small movement within the remnant of your people that they will return to the King James Bible and they will forsake all the pagan traditions, Lord, that have come in and that are blinding the people. They will forsake the ways of the world, Lord, and they will seek that real, true, pure relationship between you and them that can only come from a personal relationship through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I just pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that's it. Thank you for watching.